Hello my fellow working class heroes, good day! I am Carlo and welcome to Carlo Excels. In this episode, we'll talk about item analysis. Specifically, we'll talk about the internal consistency or reliability part of item analysis. In this video, we'll focus less on the calculation and more on the meaning behind reliability and internal consistency so that you'll properly understand how to interpret the quality of your test items based on the results of your calculation for reliability. Before anything else, if you're new to this channel, hello, this is Carlo Excels, a channel that is dedicated to teaching my fellow teachers here in the Philippines Microsoft Excel. Occasionally, I also create additional lessons like this that will be helpful for my fellow teachers. Please like this video and share this video to your fellow teachers and drop a comment down below. It'll really help with the YouTube algorithm and help those who are searching for this to find this. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, this is the fourth video in this channel series on Item Analysis Explained. The previous videos already tackled the Item Difficulty Index, Item Discrimination Index, and Multiple Choice Distractor Analysis. If you haven't watched those videos yet, I invite you to watch them first before proceeding with this video. The link to those videos can be found in the descriptions below. Now, before I continue, let me first state that this channel has an all-in-one item analysis template that helps by calculating the Internal Consistency, Item Difficulty Index, Item Discrimination Index, and multiple choice distractor analysis. If you are interested in this free, easy to use tool, please check the descriptions down below where you will find a link to the video that talks about the Carlo Excel's all in one item analysis template. The template can be downloaded in the descriptions part of that video, absolutely free, no strings attached. The reason why I'm mentioning this straight off the bat is because you can use this tool to calculate the internal consistency of your test. This video, the one that you're watching right now, has absolutely no calculations in it. I will not teach you the calculation of KR20, KR21, and Cronbach's Alpha in this video. I really want to stress that so that you don't feel like you've been clickbaited and I don't end up wasting your time. Again, this video has absolutely no calculations in it. The reason for this is, first, there are so many other YouTube videos already on the calculation of internal consistency. If you wish to learn specifically about how to manually calculate KR20, KR21, and Cronbach's Alpha, you can refer to those videos instead. Second, and more importantly, at least in my opinion, there aren't many videos that explain test reliability. Most other videos are simply like, this is reliability, this is how to calculate it, and that's it. Not many videos or even sources explain what reliability is why it's measured in the first place, and what the numbers actually mean. And that is the goal of this video. Like all other videos in the item analysis series on this channel, we'll talk less about the calculation and discuss more about the meaning of these numbers. This is most especially true for reliability since very few resources exist regarding the topic. The best way to start with this discussion is to first review why we do assessments in the first place. Assessment, in essence, is a tool that we teachers use. In our case, we use this tool to gather evidence of student learning. This evidence is what we can then use to make the proper decisions regarding instructions. In other words, assessment is a means, not an end. After years of being a student and being a teacher, it's very easy to forget and it's very easy to have it the other way around. No, learning is not the means with the exam and the grade being the end. We should always remember that assessment is the means and learning is the end. Knowing that assessments are tools is very important. The reason for this is, if you understand how other tools work, you can connect this to assessments. Speaking of all other tools, one concern we always have with our tools, most especially measuring tools, is this. Is this tool I'm using accurate? Take a weighing scale, for example. If a person is measuring his own body weight on a weighing scale, he will of course step on the scale. Let's say for example, the person is going to go, Whoa, my weight loss program and exercise program are working. From 93 kilos last month, I'm only 90 kilos today. However, it's very natural for the person to doubt. It's very normal for him to suddenly think, Wait, is this measurement true? Is this real? What if this scale is wrong? What if I'm getting my hopes up for nothing? So what do you think the person is going to do? A very normal response would be to simply step off the scale and then step onto it again. I'm sure some of you have done that before too. It's very normal to think, okay, maybe the scale was wrong the first time, so let's try it again. Now, if the scale gave the person 90 kilos during the first measurement and then 90 kilos again during the second measurement, then that settles it. He's 90 kilos. But what if the scale gave the person 90 kilos during the first measurement but 98 kilos during the second measurement? That's a problem. It casts doubt on the measurement. So which is correct? 
90 kilos or 98 kilos. So what is the person likely to do? He's probably going to measure himself again and again and again. He's probably going to move the scale to a place that's more stable and more level and he'll keep on measuring himself until he gets a stable and consistent measurement. And if the person cannot get a consistent measurement despite any steps he may take, then we can conclude that maybe the weighing scale is broken. Please note that the weighing scale is a measuring tool and all other measuring tools follow the principle that if you use the same measuring tool again for the same situation, measuring the same thing, then you must have a consistent result. Maybe not exactly identical results, but at the very least, the results must be consistent. And if there is some difference between the measurements, then the difference must not be so significant. And what if you don't get consistent results? If your results is not consistent, if you get different results every time you use that tool, then something is wrong with the tool. The accuracy of the tool is doubtful. The accuracy of the tool is called into question. So let's connect that to assessments. Remember, assessments are measuring tools. And just like any other measuring tool, assessments must yield consistent results when used over and over again. When an assessment is administered again to the same students in the same situations, then it must yield consistent results. And if it doesn't, then the accuracy of the assessment is doubtful. The ability of the assessment to truly measure learning goals and objectives is called into question. This is the concept behind test reliability. Test reliability refers to the extent to which results are consistent across different occasions of testing. When a test is reliable, it means that the test will give you the same result if you use the test again. When a test is not reliable, then the test may give you a different result if you use the test again. And if that happens, the ability of the tool to accurately measure learning goals and objectives is doubtful. So now that we know what reliability is, we have to know, how is the reliability of a test measured? The first method has something to do with our previous example regarding the weighing scale. In our previous example, we can find out if the weighing scale is reliable by using it and then using it again. If we get similar results, then the weighing scale is reliable. We can do this with our test too. We just administer the test to the students and then wait for a bit of time and then administer the test again. We then compare the results of the first taking of the test with the results of the second taking of the test and check if the results are similar. The most common method of checking the similarity of results is using Pearson Product Moment Correlation Coefficient, better known as Pearson's R. If the results of the first and second taking of the tests are similar, then the test is reliable. If the results of the first and second taking of the tests are not similar, then the test is not reliable. This method of measuring the reliability of tests is commonly known as the test-retest method. Of course, there are very obvious problems with this method. It's not always easy to administer the same test twice due to time or budget constraints. It's also possible that the students will remember the test during the first time it was administered and then they may adjust accordingly during the second time it's administered, thus tainting the results of the test retest method. Is there another way of measuring the reliability of the test by administering it just once? How can we measure the reliability of a test if we need two instances of the test but we administer it just once? Take a 10-item test, for example. We can safely assume that this whole test was created to measure particular learning goals and objectives, and the items were created to measure different but related learning goals and objectives. So if that's the case, we can administer the test just once, and then we can split the test. We take the results of, say, for example, items 1 to 5, and then we take the results of, in this example, items 6 to 10. And then we compare the results of these two halves as if they were two instances of the same test. So instead of administering a test twice, we just administer it once, split it in half, and then compare the two halves as if they were two instances of the same test. Of course, you'd ask, wait, these two halves are not the same test. Can we really compare these two halves? As mentioned a while ago, if these two halves measure the same learning goals and objectives or related learning goals and objectives, then they can be compared as if they were two instances of the same test. Now that we have these two halves, we can use Pearson's R or Spearman-Brown's prophecy formula to measure how similar these two halves are. If the results of the first and the second halves of the test are similar, then the test is reliable. If the results of the first and the second halves of the test are not similar, then the test is not reliable. 
This method of measuring the reliability of tests is commonly known as the split-half method. The split-half method, though it works on some occasions, has a flaw. How do you split the half? If you attempt to split a 10-item test into two 5-item tests, there will be 252 possible ways for you to do so, and each way of splitting the test will yield different correlation calculation results. If so, then which possible way will yield the most accurate correlation result? If you attempt to split a 20-item test, there are more than 184,000 possible ways to do so. If you attempt to split a 30-item test, there are more than 155 billion ways to do so. If so, then which possible way will yield the most accurate correlation result? So is there another way of measuring the reliability of a test by administering it just once but without having to split it in half? Then how about this? If we cannot administer a test twice, then what if we administer a test just once and then we somehow predict the result of the second test? What do I mean by this? Take the science of meteorology for example. It's amazing how meteorologists can look at weather phenomena such as hurricanes, typhoons, storms, and tornadoes and somehow predict where and when they'll start, move, and stop. They can't literally see into the future. Instead, what they do is they analyze various points of data such as temperature, wind speeds, atmospheric pressure, Earth's gravity, tides, and others. They take all of the data and by finding patterns in them, they can use these patterns to estimate with a high degree of certainty the movements of weather phenomena. That's an overly simplified summary of how weather forecasting works. We can try doing that for tests too. We have the test that we administered and then based on the data on the test and based on the differences between the scores of students, the differences of the answers of the students, and the differences in the difficulty levels of each item, we can mathematically predict the results of a second test even without having to administer an actual second test. And now that we have the results of our first test, the test we actually administered, and the results of our second test, the theoretically predicted test, we can then compare the two. If the two tests are similar, then the administered test can be considered to be reliable. If the two tests are not similar, then the administered test can be considered to be not reliable. This is the idea behind Kuder Richardson Formula 20 and Kuder Richardson Formula 21, better known as KR20 and KR21. These two formulas are among the most popular measures of reliability here in the Philippines and the overly simplified explanation of what they do is what we just discussed. These two formulas will predict the results of a second test based on the results of a first test. Then they compare the results of the first administered test to the results of the second theoretical test. If the two tests are similar, then the administered test can be considered reliable. If the two tests are not similar, then the administered test can be considered to be not reliable. Please note, however, that the KR20 and KR21 only work when the items of the test are dichotomous, meaning the items of the test should be either correct or wrong and should not have varying degrees or levels of correctness. Also, KR20 works best if the items on the test have different levels of difficulty, meaning some are easy, some are moderate, and some are difficult. If the test has items that have more or less the same level of difficulty, then KR21 works best. But what if our test is made up of non-dichotomous items or a mix of both dichotomous and non-dichotomous items? We can use Cronbach's coefficient alpha for that. Remember the split-half method from a while ago? Again, the problem with that method is which possible way of splitting the test in half will yield the most accurate correlation result? Well, one solution to this problem would be if we can't choose the method by which we split the test, then why don't we just choose all of the methods? What if we split the test in half in all possible ways and then get the correlation coefficient of all of these possible ways? Afterwards, we can then just average all of the correlation results of all of the possible ways that the test can be split in half. This idea is essentially an oversimplified explanation of what Cronbach's coefficient alpha does. Cronbach's coefficient alpha, or Cronbach's alpha for short, is another formula that is a popular measure of reliability here in the Philippines. What it does is, instead of getting the correlation coefficient of one of the many possible ways that a test can be split in half, it averages the correlation coefficient of all possible ways that a test can be split in half. After doing this, Hopefully, we can get the best possible correlation coefficient result, depending on the situation. 
So, to review, when should you use KR20, when should you use KR21, and when should you use Cronbach's Alpha? If we have a test with purely dichotomous items, meaning the items are all either correct or wrong, and the items have different levels of difficulty, then we use KR20. If we have a test with purely dichotomous items, and the items have more or less the same level of difficulty, then we use KR21. If our test is made up of non-dichotomous items, meaning items that have varying degrees or levels of correctness, or a mix of both dichotomous and non-dichotomous items, then we use Cronbach's Alpha. After applying KR20, KR21, and Cronbach's Alpha, you will get a result between 0 and 1. The closer the result is to 0, the less reliable the test is. And the closer the result is to 1, the more reliable the test is. So what result should you get for the test to be considered reliable? Well, it depends on the college professor or author you listen to. Various professors and authors will give you their own thresholds of reliability, but I can only state what I know and what I was taught. If we are talking about teacher-made tests, meaning shorter tests for smaller classes, a KR20, KR21, and Cronbach's Alpha result of 0.6 or greater is considered to be acceptable. If we are talking about departmental or batch-wide tests, meaning longer tests for multiple classes, a KR20, KR21, and Cronbach's Alpha result of 0.8 or greater is considered to be acceptable. If we are talking about large standardized tests, meaning very long tests with thousands of students taking the test, then a KR20, KR21, and Cronbach's Alpha of 0.9 or greater is considered to be acceptable. So what are the factors that can affect the reliability result of a test? The following are some of the most common causes for why your test may turn out to be not reliable. If you are using the wrong method to calculate reliability, then you're going to have a lower or higher reliability result than you should. Examples of this are when you use KR20 for non-dichotomous items or KR21 for dichotomous items that have varying levels of difficulty. The length of a test will definitely affect reliability. Longer tests tend to be more reliable than shorter tests. The number of test takers will also affect reliability. The more students take your tests, the more data you have, and the higher your reliability result tends to be. The reliability of the test will also be affected if the items have similar levels of difficulty. If all of the items are too easy or all of them are too hard, you're going to have a lower reliability result. That's why it's always good to vary the difficulty and complexity of your test items, such as when you use Bloom's taxonomy to guide you in creating variations in your test questions. The results of item discrimination analysis will also affect the reliability of your test. If your items have poor or bad discrimination, the reliability of your test will be lower. Usually, tests are designed to test similar related objectives. However, if your test has items that measure the student's achievement of very different or even unrelated learning objectives, the reliability result of the test tends to be lower. That's why you shouldn't measure students' learning in different subjects or different unrelated topics in just one test. The subjectivity of grading also plays a part in affecting reliability. With the grading of essays or short answer items on a test depends on the teacher's opinion or mood, the reliability result of the test tends to be lower. Try creating objective standards of grading when grading essays, problems, case studies, or short answer items. Unfortunately, extrinsic factors beyond the teacher's control can also affect the reliability of a test. Anything that can potentially distract the student while taking the test, like noise and poor ventilation, will hamper the student's abilities to answer the questions properly. These factors can lower the reliability of your test. Before we end our discussion on test reliability, let me again state that this channel has an all-in-one item analysis template that helps by calculating the reliability, item difficulty index, item discrimination index, and multiple choice distractor analysis. If you're interested in this free, easy-to-use tool, please check the descriptions down below where you'll find a link to the video that talks about the Carlo Excel's all-in-one item analysis template. The template can be downloaded in the descriptions part of that video, absolutely free, no strings attached. So that's it for our lesson on test reliability and our series on Item Analysis Explained. I really hope I earned your subscription today. Once again, I am Carlo and this is Carlo Excels. Thank you very much for watching.